Welcome back to the Restore Our Planet podcast with me, your host, Jack Cole. This week for episode six, I'm joined by Stan Smith from Kent Wildlife Trust, who's going to be talking with us about exciting new rewilding plans set to transform the British countryside. We discuss how rewilding works and some of the species ready to make a return, such as bison, the ancestors of which vanished from these islands many millennia ago. Our old friends, the beaver, make a comeback and we talk about many others. If you like this episode and would like to follow Stan's work, please follow links in the description. And if you would like to support us, you can make a donation at restoreourplanet.org or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Enjoy the conversation. Hello, welcome to everybody listening. I'm here joined this week with Stan from the Kent Wildlife Trust. Stan, how's it going? Yeah, very well. Hi, Jack. How are you doing? Yeah, good, yeah, thank you. So Stan, would you like to start things off by telling us a little bit about your background? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I'm Stan Smith. I'm the Wilder Landscapes Manager for, for Kent Wildlife Trust. I've been working in uh, conservation for about, crikey, eight or nine years now, following a sort of degree in zoology, probably a quite a common path for people working in conservation. Um, yes, focused a lot on kind of practical, you know, conservation work in the background, working on nature reserves as a ranger for a few different, different organisations. Um, and then spent a lot of time talking to farmers about, you know, how do we sort of encourage more kind of uh, wildlife friendly farming and how do we get farmers to kind of talk to each other. But nowadays I spend most of my time talking about wilding, rewilding and trying to make that happen in our corner of Kent, really, and seeing how we can yeah make a difference. Fantastic. So we were just talking before we came on how many definitions of rewilding, wilding there are. And I just wondered if you could give me which is... Your definition. <laughs> um, I think oh, we could talk about this forever, probably. The um, For me, it's all about thinking about trying to make a system um, whereby natural processes are allowed to function. It's about trying to sort of allow nature, give it the tools it needs to kind of manage itself. And so I think it's whether the what the interventions end up looking like it becomes more about the way you think about it uh, you're thinking about the processes have i got you know is the pollination cycle working well enough have i got you know that decomposition working on site and if you think about it from that kind of natural processes and effectively more of those cycles that you can help kick start over time then you're moving to a more rewilded state uh where you know we'll be more resilient to whatever comes next we just want ecosystems that are as complicated as they possibly can be with as many interactions going on with each other and that way you know whatever happens climate change new diseases coming down the line species extinction it'll be able to cope with that if you think about it all together but it doesn't work if you just think about one thing in isolation that's that's it for me anyway <laughs> brilliant no it's uh well, concise enough it was it was uh understandable anyway um so so stan uh i know that you've been working a lot with bison and reintroduction of bison at the moment obviously quite a quite an interesting species to to bring back as it were would you like to start <laughs> by by telling us a little bit about maybe perhaps the history of the bison where it disappeared to uh, why we're we bringing it back and yeah, what, what are we hoping to, uh, to achieve through rewilding? Sure. Well, I thought we, uh, the reason we started with bison, we wanted to start with something really small that nobody would notice where it would be um, and that no one would even know that it was going to happen. So, so we started with Europe's largest land mammal, bison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lovely. <laughs> but um, no, it's, um, uh, yeah, fascinating, really. Uh, there's so much kind of that we don't know about the history of, of bison. Um, but really, the the things that we do know are that once upon a time, probably 30,000 years plus ago, we had a species of bison in, in the UK called the, the steppe bison, um, which ha, which uh, are, were a kind of, you know, enormous shaggy cow thing with enormous horns sticking out the side, pointing forwards. They were pretty, pretty massive. Um, but uh, sort of around 30,000 years ago and up to more recently, these all went extinct. Um, and some of them sort of interbred with the prehistoric cow, the aurochs. Um, and so they sort of gave birth to, over many, many generations, uh, the European bison that we, that we know today. And so uh, although we have lost those steppe bison, 
the the European bison we have are effectively sort of the closest living ancestor we had to this kind of uh, you know real mover and shaker in our environment. You know, the European bison, Europe's largest land mammal, has been for thousands and thousands of years. Um, you know, the male bison can weigh up to a ton. Um, and, uh, you know, at the, at the shoulder, at sort of at the hump, they can be, you know, up to about seven feet tall. So they are, they really are fantastic uh, sort of engineers of the landscape, but just through their physical size that they can, you know, move around and, 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 and shake things up a bit. Um, so, yeah, so, but uh, the European bison really are one of, you know, nature's great survivors. You know, they have been with us since before the last ice age. And they are, you know, one of the last mega herbivores we have. They really are that kind of prehistoric, you know, animal that 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 our uh, you know, hunter gatherer ancestors would have known and and uh, you know tried to tried to hunt probably for meat. I imagine at, at those times. So they are one of nature's great survivors, a truly wild animal, not domesticated in any way, um, and so they retain all of these kind of wild natural behaviors that, that that you know domesticated animals you know have have bred out of them in terms of so they are hugely intelligent they are hugely uh, adaptable to different environments and so there's so much uh, amazing stuff that they're able to do that, that you know domestic cows can't you know they, they, they you know we didn't want them to at the time um so but unfortunately they did all go extinct but you know to all extents of purposes all european bison were lost uh, at the sort of the turn of the of the 20th century, um, you know, they really had dwindled in number so much so that then the last remaining ones in the world were all collected up and brought into captivity. And at that time, we had as few as 12 breeding pairs, 12 individuals that, you know, 12 females that were then able to go on and, and, and breed. And so since then, there's been a kind of whole European, whole worldwide breeding program to try to bring them back. And we're now about six and a half thousand animals across Europe. So wow. it's working, it's really and working. In, in Europe, just to clarify, is that, are they now been re-released into the world across Europe? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but, so they started off in captivity, then they were bred and released. Bred and released, yeah. So all, all the uh, bison that we have today, all descend from ancestors that were once in captivity. Uh, so a kind of really strange situation where you now have these wild animals that were, that were lost as wild animals. Um, but no, since the sort of the, I think it's about the 1950s in uh, in Poland and Bielowieża, they started to do uh, sort of releases into those areas. And since then, there have been releases into Romania and other, uh, into Russia and other places all across uh, across Europe. And uh, now there's a sort of a really kind of healthy, uh, growing population of wild bison, you know, out there. Um, but we still have lots of them in captivity. They're still a vulnerable species. We still have to manage their breeding very, very carefully because of this bottleneck. You know, they went down to so few individuals. They're all so closely related. It's quite careful. You have to manage yeah, it. Well. Of course, of course. And how and now, how are they going to shape the British landscape? Some more <laughs> specific behaviours that they have. What do they, what do they get up to? Oh, so many amazing. And we're finding new things out all the time. I mean, fundamentally, one of the things that makes them so different is they love eating woody material. Now, most cows will eat some kind of woody material, but then usually take it from the ends of the branches. But the difference between bison is they will take bark from the trunk of a big tree. They will deliberately go and eat that, particularly in the winter. So even when there's no other food to find around, they can find food by taking bark off the trunks of trees. Um, and that's amazing. It has so many implications for how our woodlands look, because if they take bark from all the way around a tree, then that tree will actually die. It will start to die back. And that might sound like a bad thing initially, but actually, if you don't have something in a woodland that is able to selectively kill off individual trees, you lose a whole system. You lose a whole complicated process whereby trees are more regularly falling over or dying back, allowing more light to the woodland floor, allowing other plants to regenerate in their place. And, and actually that kind of action that bison is taking of, of, of you know, ring barking a tree, of, of allowing it to die off, is exactly what we do as conservationists with chainsaws, coppicing, have done for hundreds of years. But a bison will do it just by what it wants to eat. You know, there's that, so that's one of the real, the real big ones. Um, but there are lots, there are so many things that they can do. <laughs> Go on, please, I'd love to hear. Well, one that I heard really recently, which I thought was fascinating and didn't know about at all, 
I was chat chatting to a to a to a sort of bison es expert in the Netherlands, Leo Linartz. He's one of the real kind of uh, pioneers of use of bison across Europe, and he was telling me that um, uh, with kind of some invasive species, things like uh, rhododendron that we have in this country in, in a big way that can be a real problem for us, Nightmare. and we have, to, we have to manage our woodlands, you know, for it, and it can take over. Well, they found that in some parts of the Netherlands that bison had been deliberately going and trampling down on bits of rhododendron and then peeing on it and then rolling around in it, rolling around in, in this in this rhododendron. And it was they think it's because effectively the bison are creating their own insect repellent, that they're actually Wow. using the kind of sap which is quite toxic from rhododendron and other similar species like cherry laurel things like that um that will actually keep away you know pests uh, you know and flies and things that they don't want on themselves so that's amazing if you think about that they they have the nouse to potentially create their own um you know anti-mosquito spray effectively right, right. but also you know if that means that bison are then going to help trample down this invasive species how fantastic is that yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe next summer I should just go and roll around in a load of rhododendron <laughs> to to fend off the flies. Okay. Perfect. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Good. Okay. So what what kind of uh, knock on effects does the bison's behaviour have on other species? Well, all sorts of things actually, and um, and in fact the 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 um the woodland where we're going to uh, be bringing bison uh, bison in is home to a particular rare species of butterfly called the the heath fritillary. Uh, it's a it's a tiny little very very rare butterfly. And the heath fritillary, this is just for an example, is, um, is its main food plant is something called cow wheat. And this cow wheat only grows in open patches within woodlands, like areas that have been recently cleared. Um, you know, and so the butterfly's actual other common name is the woodman's follower. So it would follow around where new recent areas of woodland have been cleared or coppiced or that and that kind of thing. And so if the butterfly needs these this plant to grow and the, and the and the plant needs these open areas then bringing bison in which are able to create these open sort of woodland glades by ring barking trees and, and moving from place to place it should be absolutely fascinating to see how that can implicate uh, you know how that can uh, have an effect on the population of this tiny butterfly so the two are entirely linked and and it's the case for all across the food chain all across different you know levels in the food web that effectively just by mixing things up in their environment by moving through and transporting seeds with them as they go and and, and pushing things over and creating open space right. so many different niches are created because they just make a difference in kind of the structure of the woodland so fascinating stuff yeah yeah that's really interesting how do they behave around people <laughs> Well, that's a good one, actually. Bison are, I mean, they're they're big, and so you would think on well, on first sight, probably quite scary. You know, they have got horns, but actually, they are so big, and they have always been pretty much the biggest thing out there. They're not really bothered by you, <laughs> you predators, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They don't really, you know, even I. I mean. I don't know for a fact because we haven't seen much predation on bison you know there hasn't we haven't had the populations out there to be able to know you know what predators of bison there are but even a, a pack of hungry wolves is not going to tackle uh you know a herd of bison because they're you know it, it just is not going to be a win situation for them so other than when when their calves are very very young they're not really bothered by kind of any anything really and even so, it's so much to, as, as that, um, again, in Holland, where they've been using bison for about 15 years, they've actually done experiments with dogs, uh, you know, taking them through bison areas with dogs on leads. And the response has been, well, pretty much nothing. You know, the, the bison are slightly interested the first time they ever see a dog, and then they kind of just carry on doing their own thing. And, um, and because they are, they are very large, they have this idea of um, their behavior is to kind of force you to move out of their way. They don't tend to, to charge or, you know, have great big long running stampede or anything like that. If they're unhappy and you're too close, you're in their personal space, they'll just start to turn to face to you and look at you with their head down. If they're really grumpy, they might paw at the ground a little bit and then you know everyone moves out of their way <laughs> eventually yeah, of and i've experienced this firsthand we we had this where we were getting much too close taking photographs of their two two-day-old calf 
And all they did was they turned to face us and, you know, we soon got the impression to move. Up, <laughs> so very yeah. calm. The frown. Good, good. Okay. So that's um pretty interesting. So tell me a little bit more about uh, some of these other species that you guys are looking to reintroduce, such as pine martin and chaff and others. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, it's just such an interesting time, I think, for conservation. I mean, perhaps it's a reflection of how dire things have got with our kind of, you know, the state of the the, the habitats that we have in the UK, you know, more widely and, the, uh, you know, the state of nature reports that we get that just keep showing that species declines are, are happening, you know, very much before our eyes. And so I think that that has, has resulted in a bit of a shift in mindset that we have to be more actively involved in restoration we can't just be looking after what we've got right now and trying to keep things maintain the status quo because things are pretty bad so we have to move to a system of restoration which means putting back things that we have lost uh, so that we can make those systems more complicated so that we have those those things those behaviors those um you know engineers of the environment are put back and we can uh, you know, start to have a kind of more functioning, you know, ecosystem. And so that includes things like, uh, like pine martin. I mean, pine martin are, you know, an incredible species. They are, um, you know, predators of gray squirrels, who quite a, you know, a, themselves, th themselves an invasive species, a problem yeah, yeah. for forest managers across the country. And uh, so, you know, having pine martin back could really have a, a big effect on, on squirrel populations, not just by direct eating, but just because uh, gray squirrels are afraid of pine martins so oh, they're really they're really they're terrified of them and so and so having that predator back in the system that was once there uh means that the gray squirrels stop eating and they stop breeding as much and so you have these much bigger population effects rather than just specifically going out and eating gray squirrels so there's so many great things that can happen and we've got you know we have a very heavily wooded landscape in kent you know we we do have a good tree cover in many parts of the county with the high weald and the bleen landscape. And so if we can just tackle a few major connectivity issues in terms of, uh, you know, roads and things like that, if we can just do take a leaf out of the, the Europeans book and a few more kind of wildlife crossings, then there's no reason why we can't have pine martin back in our landscape and all sorts of other other wildlife too. So yeah, pine martin is on the case on, on the cards in the near future. Beavers are already here in Kent, you know, they are in, they are around and we do have beavers all across the country and with a pending government decision on whether they're going to be, you know, allowed to stay in many, many parts of the country, then, you know, that's something that we need to look at very carefully and make sure that we've got all the kind of management systems in place so that people can learn to live with beavers and that they know how to, you know, if they have a, an issue, then they know how to deal with that, but also take advantage of the opportunities that beavers bring in terms of, uh, flood storage, but also ecotourism and, you know, so there's so many great things that can happen from having these land, these animals back in our landscape. So beavers and pine martin are kind of right now. And then we're looking at a red billed chuff reintroduction to Dover next year. Iconic. Um, yeah. that's, oh, absolutely. I mean, you don't get anything. It's nothing better than that, really, just to see this enormous, great sort of crow species, glossy red bill, shiny red legs. There's nothing else that really looks like it. Um, that can just be out there over the white cliffs of Dover. They're so kind of charismatic. They wheel and turn in the air, fantastically acrobatic. They're mentioned in Shakespeare, uh, you know, they're yeah, in Shakespeare the around Shakespeare. Dover. Uh, you know, it's, uh, they're, in the, they're in the legend of uh, sort of Thomas Beckett around Canterbury Cathedral, supposedly. That's where the crow got its red beak from, dipping in the executed Thomas Beckett's blood. Uh, oh, so there's all these kind of yeah, yeah. myths and legends. I uh, yeah. can't wait to see them back. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Well, a lot of positives. Is there a hmm. kind of, what are the main challenges for everybody? Who's sort of pushing back, if hmm. anyone? It's a good question. I think... Um, there, there, there are lots of different voices to be to be heard in this. I mean, obviously, where we're trying to do this in, in Kent, you know, is a very busy part of the UK. We're not you, you, you don't have the space, you know, and you wouldn't want to just, you know, designate an area of land and put the animals inside it and keep the people on the outside. That's never going to work. It's all about trying to, you know, integrate people and wildlife into these landscapes, I think, you know, about allowing coexistence to, to happen. And I think most of the um, issues around kind of wilding, wilding and species reduction are, you know, they're social issues, I think. I think it's about having good, strong management processes in place that people know 
what to do if they are concerned about an animal that you can hear or different people's voices. And I think that's that's where we really you know, have got a lot of lessons to learn there. I think, you know, in the past, perhaps the conservation movement as a whole hasn't engaged with local communities in the right way. And people have felt like they haven't been heard. And I think that's where you get that's where you get problems. Um, yeah. But having said that, from our from our conversations around bringing bison to the bleen, overwhelmingly positive. I am so you know, uh, in awe of people, local people, and how willing they are to accept mm. a big change like this and just be so excited about it. Obviously, there are lots of small issues to work through and little challenges along the way, but overwhelmingly positive. And I think, you know, you've got to give people credit, you know, that they do want to see wildlife out there and, and you know, people are willing to kind of, uh, you know, adapt, you know, if the systems are in place. Brilliant. You mentioned a moment ago that this is obviously a very exciting time to be in conservation and rewilding. Um, obviously, a lot of that comes from basically people just, you know, reading the news, uh, mm. looking out the window, <laughs> seeing what's happening in Australia, etc. Mm. Um, so tell me, what do you hope to see by something like 2030, 2035? <laughs> what direction are we heading in, Stanley? What do I think? I feel, oh, wow, I feel very positive when I speak to individuals and I think we will see animals, more animals back in our landscape. I think we will see more species reintroductions. And so there are so many really successful ones happening at the, at the moment. I hope we see more joined up landscapes. I hope we can have the systems in place so that wildlife can move more freely across, across, the, across the landscape. But I think the real barriers that we have are, are not with individual people. They are with you know, the structures we have in place around, you know, legislation and, and the things that we have in terms of, you know, big uh, industry that, you know, works in a certain way and can be very slow to, to turn in a different direction. So I think there are some really big challenges to overcome. But I think if we can get enough ground support for seeing functioning wilded landscapes with wildlife and people at their core, if, if people are asking for that, I think it will happen. I think we will see more wildlife bridges. We will see beavers across our landscape. I think that's going to happen anyway. I don't think you can avoid that. Yeah, uh, and they're I off think, the beavers, aren't they? They're sort of doing it themselves. They're doing it themselves. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think decisions around that are probably neither here nor there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the beavers will do it for themselves. So yeah. I think we just need to learn to, to live with that and have the systems in place. So I'm very positive about it all. <laughs> good, good. All right, Stanley, so where... If someone wants to sort of find your work, see what you're up to, check in, where could they find you? Yeah, I mean, definitely check out our website, uh, www.kentwildlifetrust.org.uk. Uh, do go to our Wilder Bleen pages there to have a look at our at our bison introduction projects. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we've got pages on there about red build chuff reintroductions, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, check us out. Fantastic. Stan, thank you. You're welcome.